uh, my day job is uh, as head of research at the Allison Project, research and demonstration farm in, in Leicestershire. Um, and we carry out research there at the experimental plot scale, but also at the landscape scale. And it's that landscape scale research that I want to talk to you about, the um, water trendy farming experiment. So, uh, just to, to give you an idea of uh, where we are, we're in the headwaters of the Welland River Basin. Um, and uh, our research and demonstration farm is in the Ibrook tributary of that. Um, and the work I'm talking about is in the headwaters of that Ibrook tributary. And the question we're asking is this water-friendly farming project as a whole is really it's a bit of a reality check. Um, so to what extent can we really move towards all these objectives that we have in terms of water quality and flood risk management and aquatic biodiversity um, by implementing a range of me measures that are <coughs> evidence-based but are also acceptable to farm businesses. They're, they're well grounded and they fit in with farm, uh, farmers' business objectives. And there's been a lot of talk about monitoring this morning and the need for monitoring, um, it's often quite difficult to interpret that monitoring unless you have a really strong baseline and that is what we established in this, in this project, three years of baseline data collection before we did anything at all so that we could understand what was going on at the background um, before we implemented any changes. So this project is a collaboration between ourselves at the Allison Project and the Freshwater Habitats Trust, uh, who have a lot of expertise in um, aquatic biodiversity uh, at a whole range of scales, not least at the Cashman scale, and um, York University, who, um, who do the hydrological modeling for, for the project. So this is, I said it was an experiment, it is an experiment, and it has a very rigorous experimental design, a backing design, before, after, control, impact. So we have the strong baseline over a three-year period, we have two treatment catchments, and we have a control catchment where we do nothing but monitor, um, and the whole area is around about 3,000 hectares. So based on three headwaters, one in the Saw, and one in the Welland uh, River Basin. So it's mixed uh, land use, arable, livestock, small woods. Um, each headwater, headwater catchment has one village in it, and there are uh, obviously rural houses distributed across the area as well. Um, what are we monitoring? All these things. Um, mainly the nutrients, the sediment, and, and the flow. But these other things are, are, as well. And we're monitoring mainly at the base of each of those headwater catchments because we're interested in what that area of farmland is exporting to the main river and the implications of that for the, our target. <coughs> but we're also monitoring at around about 300 sites across that 3,000 hectare study area, uh, the aquatic farm <coughs> and invertebrate communities which reflect the water quality. So those plants and those invertebrates help us to, to understand what's going on within each of the headwater catchments. And that's adding to our knowledge of our, our main data collection of the base of each of those catchments. So this is just an example of the sort of data we get. This is from the um, base of the, the Ibrook uh, headwater catchment where we're working. Um, example of uh, suspended sediment data and, um, and flow. So we can use these data to get a rough idea of how much soil is being lost from this agricultural area. We reckon it is only a rough figure, but we reckon it's around about half a ton of soil per hectare per year is being lost from the agricultural area. That's a loss to the farmland. It's um, likely to have implications for future, future, future land management. But above all else, it, um, <coughs> it, it reflects poorly functioning soils. Um, that means poorly functioning soils, both in terms of water management and in terms of crop management. So that's an area that we need to focus on, and that's we're talking about uh, identifying areas of common ground earlier on. That's an area of common ground, quite literally, um, for uh, people involved in natural flood management and uh, the farming community. 
but of course that loss of soil it's all going downstream and it's, it's uh, causing sedimentation of drainage channels uh, and um, that is increasing flood risk downstream. So we need to, uh, we need to accept that that's, that that's happening, we need to understand it uh, in order to take some measures to, to address that as well, of course, of recognizing the importance of direct runoff and the, the direct implications that has for, for flood risk downstream. So, there are a number of things we can do in these headwater catchments, and this, is in, this includes tiny uh, ditches and streams we were talking about just a minute ago, as well as the main, the main stream. A number of uh, areas that we can work in. We want to maintain the field drain flow we do not want to impede the drain flow, because if we do that, then we're going to accelerate surface runoff and increase soil erosion and, and uh, sedimentation of water courses. We want to maintain drain flow, but we want to improve our management of the soil above those drains in order to, um, in order to increase the, the buffering capacity of the soil some extent, there's some limited capacity for that, but more importantly, to reduce the amount of erosion that goes on through surface runoff. So that's one consideration. The other is, what we've been hearing about this morning already, introducing permeable dams into these small channels. Again, we don't want to impede base flow, even winter base flow, we don't want to impede the base flow but we want to hold the water back behind these permeable dams uh, so as to attenuate flood peaks downstream. <coughs> so this is the sort of structure that we've been um, putting in place. It's a, 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 a local tra uh, contractor builds these for us um, wherever possible, and it's not always possible, but wherever possible we're using local materials. We've tried different types of timber. Most of the dams are now built at, uh, using uh, larch cordwood. Um, simple structures, predominantly to hold water back in channel, but sometimes to, to uh, encourage um, flooding of adjacent land where that land is not productive. And um, simply from building these dams and uh, talking to farmers about uh, where to put them and that sort of thing, we've learned an awful, uh, an awful lot. We've learned uh, that um, some, some dams are, uh, or some designs are, might be fine in a very small water course, but um, not, not, so, not so good on, a, on the main channel. Um, we have had some damage to some of them on the main, on the main channel. It's all part of the learning. We're modifying the design, uh, and we've re replaced those. Um, ensuring that there is base flow, we have a, a tree trunk along the base of the dam um, to hold the, the dam up so that it's not impeding base flow. Um, there are some lessons, some lessons to learn around that to ensure that that doesn't move, uh, to ensure that there isn't scouring of the, of the stream bed, and also understanding the, um, the influence of the, the depth of the, the stream below the, the, the dam um, in terms of controlling flood risks um, with different um, intensity of storm events. Uh, there's all sorts of important lessons to understand there. So uh, you won't be able to see this um, very well perhaps, but it just shows the distribution of those uh, dams. So we put in place 30 in the headwaters of the Ibrook catchment. Um, and we've used the uh, hydrological modeling that uh, Colin Brown has done at York University to inform sort of optimal uh, locations for those, for those dams. Um, and we've then taken that to the, to the farmers in, in the study area and um, that has involved a lot of uh, change to where those dams might go. Um, and as we've heard already this morning, the farmers understand their land and they, they not only understand their objectives for that land, but um, they understand where the water goes and how it behaves. And that, that knowledge is absolutely crucial in terms of siting these, these, these dams. And so a lot of them are not sited where we had originally intended, um, but are 
uh, sited in equally suitable locations and are operating very well, capturing um, uh, uh, holding back a lot of water. And um, we are using time lapse photography, uh, as we heard um, from Josh, and we're using that to inform the modeling process. So the models are constantly being refined according to how the water is behaving behind, behind the dams. So a really ground truth thing. Um, what we're doing in terms of the modeling to, to better understand how, um, better understand the performance of the dams at the landscape scale. Not just individual dams, dams, dams but at the landscape scale. So, emerging results. <coughs> the results currently being uh, analyzed um, for the for the headwater, based on the headwater catchment, and also the implications for further downstream, um, and they will be available. I would have thought in a couple of months, something like that. Um, but the rough indications at the moment are that we're seeing around about 25% um, reduction in flood peak uh, at the base of the, the headwater catchment, um, and in some cases we're seeing a, a delay of around about an hour of that flood peak as well. So that's um, uh, quite substantial benefits in terms of uh, flood risk downstream. But more to come on that. Uh, as I say, there will be more in around about a couple of months. And uh, one uh, means of uh, accessing the results from this research and the other research we're doing at the Allerton Project is uh, to log onto the, uh, the, the blog that you see in front of you. Okay? Thank you.